Next, author James Carroll talks about the history of Jerusalem with a panel of theologians and religious leaders at the Interfaith Center of New York City. It's a little under an hour and 15 minutes. Let me just say, this book has a very personal sort of jump start for me. I was a young man, as you just heard from, from Chloe, um, who was shaped in very large ways by my Catholic faith, uh, but also by my experience as the son of an Air Force officer. I, I came of age uh, in Wiesbaden, Germany, which was less than 100 miles from the Iron Curtain in the late 50s and early 1960s. And I was actually defined by a sense of, of the imminence of the Soviet threat, understanding our place in, uh, in the world, our being the American forces in Germany and the, including the American dependents, us innocent kids, that, that we were in effect, I didn't know it to think of this symbolic language, we were in effect on the altar. Uh, we were the tripwire also, that if, if the Soviets moved into West Germany, the first thing they would do was hit us, which would immediately require the United States of America's involvement in resisting the Soviet move. We were the guarantee for Europe that the Soviet Union could not move to the West without bringing down the wrath of American nuclear power. And I actually had my high school chums and I, we used to joke about being uh, the sacrificial lambs and, 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 the, and the trigger. We, we had a kind of wry, um, dark sense of humor about it. We were terrified. I didn't realize this until later, really, how nuclear dread defined us coming into our adulthood. And so it was not, and again, only later do I understand what I was doing, it was not surprising, therefore, with a vivid sense of the edge of the nuclear abyss. It wasn't so surprising that, as a young man, uh, my first impulse to become an Air Force officer, like my father, gave way fairly quickly to a second impulse, which was to embrace the life of religion. Because I thought religion was the opposite of war. And I thought God was the opposite of the human temptation to massive violence. And so I entered the seminary. And through the 1960s, like many of you having the privilege of growing up in those years, not Chloe Breyer, Breyer <laughs> by the way, um, had the privilege and the burden of reckoning with the ways in which religion wasn't the opposite of war. Religion was implicated in it. In my experience, that had to do with reckoning with the church's history in relationship to the Holocaust, and also in a very powerful way, reckoning with the complicity both of Christian and Catholic institutions and subliminal Christian assumptions in American foreign policy, the implication of my religious identity with the war in Vietnam, which was started by a Catholic despotic Inquisition-style regime, the Noden Diem family in Saigon. So by the time I was ordained, 1969, became a priest, religion and violence defined, those were the brackets within which I was living my life. And it's not a surprise, I suppose, that I defined my whole five years as a priest because I was conscripted into it, not because I chose it, by the anti-war movement, which is when I first met Jim Morton when Jim Morton was one of the prophets of the anti-war movement. And so by 1960, 1973, I, my priesthood was a mess. I didn't really know where I was. And it, it can't be a, a coincidence that where I went with the feeling of being a mess was to Jerusalem, not knowing what to expect. And what I found, of course, was a mess. And uh, the first thing I learned in Jerusalem was that God doesn't come to us in our purity, in our being uh, fixed, in our being finished, uh, that God comes to us in our being a mess. And it was that sense of Jerusalem as the defining way in which the human reception of God takes place, not the only place, of course, but certainly for Western civilization defining. 
it was a place in which I actually came into a sense of myself, able to be at home in the mess of my life, to embrace it. And why? Because it was somehow there that I did have an experience, as religious people have had going back through the centuries, of the present oneness of God. The, Tillich's notion of the ground of our being, that there is something essentially unquenchable in existence itself, and that became palpable somehow for me in Jerusalem. I have to say in parenthesis here that my, my home in Jerusalem was Tantur, a wonderful Catholic institution that has been presided over over the last decade by my old and dear friend, Father Michael McGarry, who's in the audience tonight, and I want to acknowledge Michael McGarry for all that he has given me about Jerusalem in particular. So I left the priesthood, but I embraced my religious identity as a Catholic in a new way, with a new fullness, which is ironic. And it uh, always was clear to me at some point I would return to Jerusalem as a subject. I've returned to Jerusalem as a visitor, a pilgrim, and as a student again and again. But now in this book I've returned to it as a subject. Jerusalem today is in the eye of a storm. We're all fully aware of that. The Arab Revolution sweeping North Africa and the Middle East, source of tremendous hope and expectation, also source of concern, worry, understanding how badly things could go. Religion and violence, both, very vividly. The tectonic plates of not just the Middle East, but in a way of the Western world shifting right below our feet. At the center of it, Israel, Palestine. Also at the center of it, a new and contemporary form of nuclear dread, not the old standoff between the Soviet Union and the United States, but this new, less clearly defined, but in some ways because of that, more terrifying than ever way in which nuclear weapons are on the margin of every power struggle and in a very particular way in the Middle East. So, what about it? Very quickly, a tremendous source of hope by looking through the lens of the history of Jerusalem at problems of the human condition. So let me just very quickly give you a quick a tour through uh, many centuries of history to make the point. Out of ancient violence, sacrifice, the Babylonian destruction, Jerusalem invented a new vision of human interconnectedness. We know that as monotheism. A better word for that is the oneness of God. That unquenchable vitality that I myself had a personal experience of in Jerusalem, but which has defined that place for religious believers century in and century out. From the ruins of the Roman destruction in 70 came an orienting memory for exiled Jews and a permanent ideal for Christians. Jesus, as a Jew, nonviolent, one of the very few things we know about him for sure, a movement that then swept the Mediterranean world, which is itself the great mystery of who this man was. Constantine revalorizing Jerusalem, making it the source of unity for a widely dispersed empire with a dark consequence, theologizing the diaspora of the Jewish people as a Christian proof. In the seventh century, within five years, within five years of Muhammad's death, Islamic forces drew to the gates of Jerusalem and took the city nonviolently. Why is that? What was it about Jerusalem that drew the first sweeping movement of Muslim peoples? Why? Like a magnet drawing the, 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 the diverse iron shavings of religious imagination from every direction to itself. In the Middle Ages, the early Middle Ages, Jerusalem is the center of a locating vision of Christendom, what we call Western civilization. It takes hold in Jerusalem, the temple, a special symbol, which then becomes a special symbol de defining Europe, the Knights Templars, Dan Brown. We go all through the centuries with a kind of constant reference back to what? Jerusalem. So much so that when 
Christopher Columbus makes his move to the West, it isn't the Indies he's after. He's after a new, more efficient and safer route to Jerusalem. We secular Americans don't emphasize this agenda of Columbus's, but his chronicles are full of it. His wish to bring Europe to Jerusalem. As the Ottoman Empire lost its way in opulence in the 18th, 19th centuries, the noble sanctuary in the center of Jerusalem remained a touchstone of the Islamic conscience and is still a defining note of the Islamic conscience. And a hundred and some years after Columbus, when those Puritans settled in New England or came to New England, what was it that they said they were doing? They were founding a city on a hill, Jerusalem. And the settlement that they founded after that sermon, when they got off that boat, was Salem, not Boston. It was Salem, another word for Jerusalem. When the dissenters in Salem moved on, where did they go? They crossed the border into what's now New Hampshire and established their own settlement. What did they call it? Salem. Salem, New Hampshire, less than 50 miles from Salem, Massachusetts. Salem, Jerusalem, Zion, the most commonplace names in the United States of America. What is this? The American ideal of the city on a hill is a measure against which, against which we still check the requirements of realism. Columbus, Winthrop, Abraham Lincoln, whose last words whispered to his wife at the theater were, I think I should like to see Jerusalem. Ronald Reagan, whose most resonant theme was the city on a hill, and always the primordial memory of the holy city, next year kept Jewish longing alive until the narrative of enforced diaspora, Christian enforced diaspora, could be reversed in 1948. Yes, Jerusalem is the ground zero still of conflict, but this is a litany of ways in which Jerusalem has been the source of the resistance to violence. I know this history can be recounted negatively. Yes, the home of apocalyptic thinking, the dreadful idea that to save the earth we must destroy it. Yes, the center of a monotheism that is self-sanctifying. We're number one. Our God is better than your God, a destructive monotheism. Yes, Jerusalem against the Jews, which is the way the Christians began to think of it. Yes, Crusader Mayhem, 1099. Yes, cults of martyrdom. Yes, fundamentalism in all three traditions. These have all found homes in Jerusalem. Fratricidal rivalry from Cain and Abel to the Israelis and the Palestinians. And yes, Jerusalem, shaped in some powerful way in our time by Auschwitz and also by Hiroshima, the two brackets within which that ancient question of the relationship between violence and religion are asked now. That is the mess of the human condition. And what do we do with it? Jerusalem is the center of a double vision. Therefore, I put before you life and death. Choose life. Recalling the importance in this history of human choice is urgent. Because if human choices have shaped this history in the past, they can still shape it in the future. So Jerusalem is a city of self-surpassing. God checked Abraham's knife here. Religion was limited by ethics here. The oneness of God makes every individual who participates in it sacred, which is the ground of the universal declaration of human rights. And the fact that God, the God of the Bible, the God of Jerusalem, perennially sides with victims instead of with those who victimize is the seed of democracy. That the temple is vacant. The Holy of Holies is vacant. This God will not be represented. 
means that no one owns this God. Therefore, no going to war in the name of God. God's elusiveness. The only thing we know of God is that God is unknowable. And in Jerusalem, humans realized that that is knowledge. That principle is the key to human freedom and to real religion. So choose. I don't believe that we have come all this way through the millennia, the hundreds of thousands of years of our development to bring about our own extinction. And yet that is what is before us now as a matter of choice. Jerusalem, as I said at the beginning, is the eye of the storm, the eye of the storm this month. Yes, Israelis are right to be wary. Palestinians are right to be impatient at promises unkept. The world is right to be alert to what is unfolding in this swirling mess. But Jerusalem, the eye of the storm, remains the best reason for keeping an eye not on fear but on hope. Both sides of the human condition the mess and the glory, and we choose Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Thank you. And now I'd like to thank you so much and invite up the other um, speakers and uh, Lisa Miller who will uh, the, as the religion editor at Newsweek and author of the book Heaven uh, which is uh, over here and available afterwards will uh, conduct the rest of this conversation so thank you Lisa I'm gonna stand up here for some quick introductions and then I'm gonna sit down and I hope we can have a conversation um, I'm hoping this will be not too formal, um, lively, casual, and, and in the interest of that, um, I'm going to skip, I, I was sitting over there editing all of the bios so that we could crunch up the time, and, and I've edited them so much that I'm just going to go through um, one by one and, and introduce very quickly um, who, who, the, who the esteemed panelists here are. At the very end of the table is Imam Faisal Abdul Rauf. He's the chairman of the Cordoba Initiative. To his left is um, the Reverend Dr. Serene Jones, who is the president of the faculty at the Union Theological Seminary. Um, next to her is James Carroll, the author of Jerusalem, Jerusalem. And to my right is Rabbi uh, Burton Vizotsky, who is the Appleman Pro Professor of Midrash and Interreligious inter Studies at Jewish Theological Cemetery. Uh, <laughs> seminary. Um, and I'm going to open with a question about Jerusalem. Um, uh, I, was, I first saw Jerusalem when I was 21 years old. Um, I was given a trip to Jerusalem by my grandparents who had fled the Nazis from Europe and um, thought that Israel was a really important place in the world. I myself grew up as a completely a religious secular Jew and had no um, religious identity except for the fact that my grandparents had fled the Holocaust. And my whole life I had been told, you know, you don't look Jewish, you don't talk like a Jewish, you're Jewish. And I arrived in Jerusalem and I got on the bus and I saw busloads of people who looked exactly like me and I thought, oh, I'm really connected to this place. I had no idea. And my experience, I think, and, and in James Carroll's book, he talks also about the power of going to Jerusalem and what it feels like and how shattering it can be, how changing it can be, how um, profound it can be, even for people who don't have any sense of identity as a faithful or religious person. So my question to the panel, um, and I'm just going to ask you to go one by one, is, Describe the first time you saw Jerusalem, and how does that vision live with you as an American, as a citizen of the world, and as a person of faith? Because the other wonderful thing about Jim's book is that 
it talks both about Jerusalem as a place, an actual physical, real place that exists in the world in time now, and also as a series of hopes and dreams and conflicts and um, paradoxes that exist in our minds simultaneously. So, um, Imam Faisal, do you want to start? I thought I going to start with the oldest religion first. <laughs> Uh, well, I first went to Jerusalem in 1978. My father, my late father, who was a close friend of uh, Jim Morton, um, was invited by the Aspen Institute to do uh, a seminar which they had been conducting there every uh, year or every other year. And uh, it was a delicate time because uh, the 1977 peace talks between uh, Begin and Sadat had just happened, and my father being an Egyptian citizen, so uh, I used to, uh, he would often invite me to substitute for him, and I was young, 30 years old, 31 years old, uh, anxious to, uh, to uh, you know, we took risks, like you said, James. So I, I went to Jerusalem for the first time then, and um, uh, it was, I, it felt like a pilgrimage. Um, you know, we believe that, as Sufis, that uh, the outer invitation can be anything, but the real, the real divine intent behind anything that has happened. You never know until you actually go there. But in my soul, I felt it was, it was God's invitation. Um, it was an important trip. It was a powerful trip. Uh, I had just gone with my father to pilgrimage in Mecca uh, in 1973. This was just five years after that. And it felt part, an important part of my spiritual journey. We, were, uh, we, we went to Bethlehem, we went to the various religious sites, we went to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and uh, to, to, to walk the streets where you know Jesus walked, uh, to walk the streets that you know the prophets walked, uh, was something which, which, which does something to oneself at a deep, deep internal uh, level. Um, and to watch, you know, how the Jews prayed at the, at the Wailing Wall uh, to be able to walk up the Temple Mount, to pray in the, in the mosque, uh, Al-Quds, to visit the Dome of the Rock and pray there as well. And, and, and for those of you who don't know the significance of Jerusalem to, um, to our faith of Islam, uh, we believe that the Prophet on one night uh, was taken by Gabriel, the Archangel Gabriel, to Jerusalem, where he prayed at the Temple Mount with all of the Prophets. From there he was raised on the night journey uh, to the various levels of heaven, where he saw angels um, standing, you know, infinite rows of angels standing, worshiping God in the standing position, the next level in the bowing position, the next level in the prostrating position, um, the next one in the seated position. And the, the, the very powerful visual, which even non-Muslims have of his Muslims praying, was certainly what the Prophet experienced. It was on that night that he was uh, given the five-time daily prayer for his community. And the choreography of the angels were incorporated in the five-time daily prayers that we perform. Jerusalem was then the first qibla, the first direction of prayer. Muslims prayed towards Jerusalem uh, until uh, a few years later when the qibla was changed to, to Mecca, to the Kaaba in Mecca, which uh, I've often believed uh, was, was something like an act of mercy from God because it was still the Qibla today. I think the tension between Muslims and the other faith religions would have been even more intense with the competition about Jerusalem. Um, Jerusalem has certainly been a very important. The rebuilding of the Temple Mount when the Caliph Omar, as you say, peacefully uh, conquered Jerusalem in 638. And most Americans and most Muslims are unaware that the, the Jewish community, which had been prohibited from living in, had been evicted by the Romans in 70 AD, were then invited by the Caliph Omar, when he invited 70 Jewish families right after the, the conquest of Jerusalem by his forces to take up residence in, in the city of David of Jerusalem. Uh, and when the, when the Jews and the Muslims and the Orthodox were also evicted in the First Crusade, I believe, from, from Jerusalem, when the Crusaders basically you know, slaughtered everybody. It wasn't until Saladin came back and reconquered uh, Jerusalem that Jews and Orthodox Christians took up residence again in, in Jerusalem. I share this because there is a, uh, 
there's a lot of misconception and we have been in the last 30, 40 years have seen the increase of, a, um, of what I call an inquisitional triumphalist interpretation of Islam become dominant. But I want to emphasize how much this particular interpretation that we have seen uh, it flies in the face of both the principles and teachings of Islam and the vast majority of our history in terms of how we interacted, engaged, and engaged with the other faith traditions. Um, so Jerusalem has this power, it has this importance, and I think it's, it's a symbolism of how, more importantly, the points that, uh, that Jim spoke about, I think raises a question to us modern people of God today. And that is, what, what and how will, will, what lessons have we taken from the past? And how can we build a new concept of a Jerusalem? This is the challenge that I believe we have today. And, uh, and to me, um, Jerusalem as a place will always be important. It will be the physical symbolism of, uh, of the geographical point, or the contact point, if you will, between God and humankind. Um, and, and it is that symbolism which is very important. And it may be important for us in, in, a, in an outer religious way, but God is greater, as we say in Arabic, Allahu Akbar, God is greater than everything. And, um, and what we learn in our spiritual path is that we have to always, um, um, the search for God, for God's face, is an eternal one. You've never arrived at it. And at every point, you have to, as a Sufi says, you have to, um, you have to give up the idolatry of a particular action that you have. You have to give up the idolatry of even your prayers. You have to, you don't worship your prayers. You do not worship Jerusalem. You do not worship uh, anything. You worship God alone. And every icon and every idol that, we, um, that, we, that comes between us and the purity of a faith in God is a form of idolatry. Uh, and this journey is, is an inner journey that we take as individuals. And, and as a society, I think it is important for us to, to remember that these names that we give ourselves today of Christian, of Jew, of Muslim, were not the labels or definitions or names that the, the founders of those faith traditions gave to their communities. Moses was among the children of Israel, or the Israelites. The name Jew didn't come till later. Christianity was not a name that was adopted by, the, by Jesus Christ or his immediate followers. They, they, it was given to them by the Romans. And even the term Muslims today is not the way our Prophet and his companions call themselves. The, the God always calls the followers of the Prophet believers. It wasn't until a century later that we called ourselves Muslims. So the, the idolatry that we have towards these identities, which actually um, are, 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 are relatively later than the founders, should teach us that we need to go back to the, to the oneness, the oneness of our faith traditions. Because it's not about, as I say, Jesus Inc., Moses Inc., Muhammad Inc., it's about God Inc., with all of these prophets as, uh, as regional representatives in time and space of the one God and the one message. So I look forward to this center being called the Interfaith Center, not the Interchurch Center, and that we see ourselves as worshippers of one God in different languages and in different choreographies, but all celebrating the diversity of the oneness of God. E pluribus unum, not only in the American sense, but also in the spiritual sense. Thank you very much, and may God bless you. Lisa, thank you for the question. Um, I, it's interesting how our uh, traditions, I think, form the way we respond and what we see. And I am now going to represent Protestantism and give you a very flat answer that's not even quite very imaginative. Uh, talk about the ultimately displaced religion that hovers above, in a sense, um, all image, and yet in doing so uh, affords itself all sorts of arrogances that it can't afford. Um, I first saw Jerusalem in 1983. I was in the middle of my seminary education at Yale, and I was on my way to India, where I was going to spend some time living in South India with a, at a seminary 
uh, Tamunade Theological Seminary sponsored by the World Council of Churches. And I was very good friends with a rabbi at Yale, Rabbi Lori Ruttenberg, who uh, implored me on my way to India that I must stop uh, in Israel on the way and spend some time in Jerusalem. Uh, so I uh, followed her uh, directives and she arranged the whole trip for me. Um, and I was met by one of her cousins at the airport and driven into Jerusalem. And the two things that I remember about that first moment, uh, or I should say those first three hours was, I grew up in Oklahoma and I thought, oh my gosh, this looks like Oklahoma. <laughs> Which, I, in one way, is a flat answer, but in another way, the commonness of it, and that it's in the desert, and that it's a place where poor and outcast people live. Uh, I immediately felt home there, and in a sense, it sacralized my own understanding of the place from which I had come in the context of Native American history and uh, uh, the history of displacement in this country. Um, the second reaction was one that I had not anticipated at all. Um, the cousin that picked me up at the airport, we immediately hit it off. Um, and she said, we have all these things planned. We're going to go here. We're going to go there. She says, but I have a very urgent matter I need to take care of. Uh, she says, I'm, I'm turning 21 next week, and I'm trying to decide if I should get married. And I have a proposal on the table. And there's this great fortune teller that I think we should go see. <laughs> And so here we were, both of us very religious people, and yet immediately in the context of Jerusalem going to participate in a religious practice that was not something that we immediately claimed as our own. In a way, I think that that represents a lot about how religion functions in the world today. It's a very unstable category. And by the way, she did not marry him. <laughs> Well, I think I've actually had the privilege of uh, speaking a lot already, and I'd, I'd love to defer to the rabbi. Okay. It's not often that rabbis get deferred to these days. It's, uh, <laughs> uh, and I, I especially, uh, I want to recognize how, what a privilege it is for me to be here with, with my colleagues, um, all of whom I, I've worked with before and who I love, and um, what a privilege it is to be here with Jim, um, whose uh, books I read avidly. Um, Faisal, I, I still turn towards Jerusalem when I pray. Um, that it has been part of Jewish yearning and Jewish practice for as long as there has been Jerusalem. Um, but to answer your question more immediately, Lisa, and with apologies to Chloe, who's getting beaten up just for being young, um, I, I first stepped foot in Jerusalem in 1967. Um, I got there one month to the day after the Six Day War. I was on a teen tour of Jerusalem. And I think the thing that struck me the most about being in the holy city as a pilgrim was seeing the remnants that the Jordanians had left behind, the barbed wire, the walls, the gates. Jerusalem had been a divided city between 1948 and 1967. And I think that the reigning sentiment among all who visited Jerusalem was that it should never be so again, that Jerusalem should be reunited and stay reunited, and that it be as it was in those heady days following the war, a place of access for all religions, that Jews could come and go freely, that Christians could come and go freely, that Muslims could come and go freely. It hasn't exactly turned out that way, and we can visit Jerusalem now and see it once again divided, this time by Jewish hands. Um, my vision of Jerusalem is not that city where we all rejoiced as kids and uh, noticed a preponderance of cats wandering the streets. Um, that's C-A-T-S. Um, <laughs> but that Jerusalem should be a shared sacred space, just as all of us share sacred ancestors who we read about and think about and look back to, who we invoke in our prayers and our memories, um, just as we all share one God, um, we should be able to share that one city. Whether it's Christian Jerusalem, wandering the churches on the Mount of Olives or the Via Dolorosa, whether it's Muslim Al-Quds 
I have had the privilege to be up on the Haram al-Sharif and see the mosques be actually under the Temple Mount and see the excavations there, or whether it's Jewish Jerusalem. And here I can't stress enough that in Hebrew, we don't call it Jerusalem, we call it Yerushalayim. And Yerushalayim, as you were talking about, that Salem, um, we can parse the end a couple of ways. One is that it is Shalem, that Jerusalem has that oneness that Faisal talked about, that it is a complete city, that it is a united city. But the other way we pronounce Jerusalem is Ir Shalom, that it would be a city of peace. Thank you all for these wonderful responses. Um, I've written a book about heaven, and in this conversation, it strikes me how similar the adjectives describing Jerusalem are to the adjectives describing heaven, and I was particularly struck when Serene said home. And when people describe heaven, they describe, they talk about home, but obviously the city on the hill is Jerusalem, and um, getting our city back at the end of time is Jerusalem. Um, I was wondering if the rabbi could talk a little bit about the place of Jerusalem and the identity of diaspora Jews, because we are never in our home. Our home is absent. That's part of who we are. I, I would like to talk about that. And let me start from a, a kind of an odd angle, uh, since it's Ash Wednesday today. <laughs> um, let me start with that other city of God, um, which was in the day Rome. Um, in the early 5th century, St. Augustine of Hippo, uh, reacting to the sack of the great city of Rome, wrote his book, City of God. And he imagined not Rome, the physical place, but the heavenly Rome. And in some very conscious way, Augustine was paralleling how Jews think about Jerusalem. That Jerusalem, even though it may not physically be ours in any given century, and God knows it has not been Jewish for most centuries, was always an idea. It was always something we prayed about. Indeed, even though Jews control Jerusalem today, we still pray about it. And we still say the same old prayer, which is, may God speedily rebuild Jerusalem. Now, we Jews amongst ourselves disagree on what that might mean. For some people, it means building as fast as possible in East Jerusalem. For some of us, it means building a Jerusalem that can be shared among all people. But it remains a, a lodestone, a, a, a touchstone for all of us to look to. Um, Yehuda Halevi, living very much in the diaspora, a man who lived in medieval Spain, said it so poignantly in two words. He said, Libi bamizrach, my heart is in the east. And I observed this poignantly in 1973 when as a rabbinical student, I had a professor who was teaching us Hebrew literature but it happened to be the semester of the Yom Kippur War. And he was physically in the classroom, but his heart was in the East. And I learned what it's like to be a Jew of the diaspora, I think from that professor, that however secure we are here in America, and we are, God knows, very secure here in America, um, there is this yearning for a homeland where you can walk the streets, as, as you had the experience, and everybody's like us, and the language is a language we all share in common, even if you may not know Hebrew all that well, and uh, that the calendar, the rhythms of the day, are the rhythms of the Jewish day, even as we can hear the Muazin call the Muslim faithful to prayer, or watch the Christian pilgrims walk the streets. So there is this dislocation. We're here, and God knows New York is one of the great Jewish cities in all of Jewish history. But still, we yearn for Jerusalem. Does anybody want to add anything? I'd, I'd love to add a word um, elaborating it, but also showing how this has impacted not just the Jewish imagination, but the imagination of the West. Let me just quickly tell you a story. So it's, it's the summer of 1916. Um, the, the British are absolutely devastated by the losses they're taking on the Western Front. 
On the first day of the Battle of the Somme, between 55 and 60,000 British soldiers fell. That was July 1st. The battle went on f until November. Uh, there were a million British casualties in that battle, in that one battle. It was the most savage uh, battle. That day was the most savage day, probably, in British military history. What was the response? The poet laureate of Great Britain commissioned a distinguished composer to set to music a poem. His purpose was to address the despair and, and fear of the British people. It was an obscure poem written in 1808 by Blake. It, it's actually the preface to a longer poem about Milton. My old friend Matt Gatch is here, and he probably could tell me the title. Uh, but the section of that poem set to music is what we know as the hymn Jerusalem. The poet laureate chose that section, that set of verses, because it's invoking of Jerusalem as the purpose for British sacrifice to enable the Lord to walk here in England again. It speaks to the power of this fantasy. It was made even more palpable a year later. The war continued to go devastatingly. And Lloyd George took one of his most important commanders away from the Western Front and said to him, I want you to lead a special expedition, the purpose of which is to bring a Christmas present to the British people, Jerusalem, which is how Lord Allenby was dispatched with an expeditionary force landing in Egypt, moving up through the Levant into Palestine, and taking Jerusalem, I think it was December 17th, in time to present Jerusalem as a present to the British people. And when Allenby took Jerusalem, the press in Britain was full of, finally, Richard the Lionheart is revenged. Uh, and of course, that was the beginning of the British double game, playing as British imperial methods always did, playing two local peoples against one another as a way of maintaining their power, uh, a double game that continues uh, today. The point being, Jerusalem defining something essential to the British imagination. So we're, you know, it's obvious why Jews should feel at home in Jerusalem. It's obvious why Muslims who've defined their religion around the Dome of the Rock and as the second most important religious symbol in the, in the tradition. But the West, the rest of us, it's an inch below the surface of our lives too. That's the point. And it's an inch uh, away from mass violence. It's always mass violence that generates this imagination. Going back to the Roman destruction of the Jewish city, you know, the Romans, Tacitus, Josephus, ancient historians tell us, that we don't know the exact number, but more than a million Jews were killed by the Romans during between 70 and 135. Going all the way back to the devastations of the Babylonians. So mass violence and the imagination tied to Jerusalem it's a human mystery. Hmm. Um, I'm going to jump off of that, if that's okay, because um, there's great stuff in your book about the connection between a yearning for Jerusalem and an identification with Jerusalem and nationalism. And it's happened here in this country, and it's happened, it's happening in Israel right now. Um, and I'm wondering, Serene, if you have any thoughts about, you know, John, when John Rithrop talked about a city on the hill, he was paraphrasing Jesus, but he was talking about Jerusalem and he was talking about America. And um, how, how is our identity as Americans shaped by Jer Jerusalem for good and for ill? Well, again, I was struck in listening to these responses how much in the Protestant imagination and uh, hints in that sort of founding Protestant story about what America is as, as a religious sensibility that has no home. It, it hovers over history. In fact, begins to then take Jerusalem into a space that can be turned into any, fa any fantasy that serves the political interests of the moment. And it gets attached to Jesus, <clears throat> so that justifies it as well. 
Um, I think that right now in the United States, in terms of the fantasies of Jerusalem, uh, yes, this notion of Jerusalem as heaven, um, but we have to always remember that when it's configured that way in the Protestant imagination, and particularly in the evangelical imagination, the flip side is hell. And so it becomes the occasion for telling a national story in which you can again and again find those who are in heaven or will be and those who are going to be in hell. And as a, as a nationalist moment, it, it sets the whole game going. I think what we see in these hearings now that are taking place with respect to Islam, uh, that, that same sensibility of being able to divide the world into the heaven that is Jerusalem and all that is not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anybody want to add anything to that? Oh, sure. Yeah. Plenty to add here. <laughs> I think there are a number of, number of themes that were mentioned. I just want to mention them as bullet points and say that they, these bullets, so to speak, or these dots, seem to form a picture. The idea of America as the new Jerusalem, Salem, Massachusetts, Salem, you know, New Hampshire, the shining city on the hill. Um, the, the idea of America as a structurally multicultural society, and an idea that, you know, we are in our diversity, we are one. And where, is that, where does that oneness lie? Um, heaven is that space where we have God's approval, or we feel a sense of intimacy with God, rather than a sense of disconnection with God. And, and, and how my own, in my own case, my own journey into my own identity was, was fraught with pain. I was born in Kuwait of Egyptian parents, when I was 18 months old, I, my dad was sent to England. Uh, at six, uh, after a few months back in Egypt, he was sent to Malaysia. I was always foreign, always felt myself alien. Um, now I came to America at the age of 17, not knowing whom I was. I felt like Humpty Dumpty. I didn't know if I was English, Malay, Arab, uh, Egyptian, and now American. Um, and that propelled me on my own journey, my own self-search for my own identity. I came here in the Vietnam War, civil rights movement, a very, very difficult time. Um, but I also observed in my journey that, that everything that was measurable about me changed every few years. Physically, I looked different every couple of years. Uh, my, 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 my thoughts, my ambitions of what I wanted to do shifted every couple of years. Even my emotions, the, the young girl whom I thought I would die if she didn't, you know, uh, grace me with her smile. After two years later, I said, what was I thinking about? So I couldn't even trust the permanence of my own emotions. And yet, I had this inner conviction that in spite of all these changes, I was still the same I, the same person, the same Faisal. Um, which made me realize that there is a self within, a self, you know, we we'll call it soul, this locus of my spirit, my, my life force, my, my identity, my ego, and, and my willpower. That, that was my own identity. And I felt most at home in New York. After coming to New York, I would go back to Egypt. I, I would be ill and wherever I was. But there's something about America, and I think something about the hope that we have here in New York, as you mentioned, Bert, of New York City being like, you know, in certain sense, maybe not the Jerusalem of history, but there's something about what we are creating here in the American experiment, which is, has the character of what God wants us to be. The fact that we're a nation under God. The fact that in our currency we have in God we trust. The fact that we really are trying to go beyond the, the and if you look even at our Declaration of Independence, that the use of you know, uh, 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 rights in, uh, an endowed by the Creator with certain inalienable rights. We talk about providential God. We, we have actually a society that has taken the, the um, the societal uh, structures or ethics of our respective faith traditions and express them in a, in a super or, you know, beyond uh, parochial language to create a society of God, a godly society. And I think that, you know, having brought, been brought up like you, Jim, in, in an era of secularism where, you know, religion was a crutch for the weak and, you know, etc., and to, to, to now seeing a resurgence of religion. I, I think, the, the, again, the, the, there is something here, I, it's inchoate in my mind, I can't express it perhaps very eloquently, I'm grasping at it, but I think there's something very important about the fact that if in fact Jerusalem becomes, and we succeed in, in making Jerusalem a prosperous city, open to all faiths, and truly international city, 
that we have, will have done a, an important step in the healing of humankind today. Uh, and healing meaning also in the sense, not only the healing of past divisions and injuries, but also in creating a sense of wholeness, a sense of oneness in spite of our diversity. And when you speak about Israel going through its own identity changes, I mean, my Israeli friends tell me the Israel of today is very different than the Israel of 1950, of 1960, of 1990. It has been undergoing rapid uh, changes in what it means to be, uh, you know, a, a, an Israeli. Uh, and, and we see this happening even with, with the revolutions in the Arab world today. Um, and how the principles of what America stands for of multiculturalism. I mean, to me, as an Egyptian, the, 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 the picture of, uh, of a Muslim holding up the Quran and next to him a, a Coptic a Christian holding up the Coptic cross, protecting each other against, you know, the, 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 sick, the secret police and, the, and trying to overthrow the Mubarak regime, is the kind of pluralism and the kind of society that I pray that we will actually be able to build. We, um we should stop this conversation pretty soon and take questions from the audience. You all have cards, and if you want to pass them to the center, write down your questions. Volunteers will come around and take them. Um, one of the things that's striking about Jim's book is that the story of Jerusalem, Bible stories, the story of God has been interpreted for ill as a story of sacrifice and violence and war and territori ter territoriality and all kinds of terrible things. And what Jim does in his book is show you, the gen show you a, gen a very generous interpretation of, of all of those issues. Um, and I commend it to you. Um, is there anything you want to say about violence? And because violence is the theme that is the spine of your book, I think. Well, it is. And I, I what I would like to add to all that's been said is that it behooves us to be wary of the, the negative impact of this um, heavenly philosophizing about Jerusalem across the world, across civilization, the negative impact of that on the actual people who live in the real city. Uh, talk about violence. The violence that threatens uh, and defines tension between Israelis and Palestinians is bad enough without carrying the weight of our fevered imaginations about it. So uh, the, the watchword, the word of caution here is that we, we also need to back off and let the Israelis and Palestinians have their place and work out their uh, tension with each other without um, putting on them, as, as Christians have certainly done for most of 2,000 years, putting on them the fate of the cosmos. Right? And defining the, uh, the fate of Jerusalem is the fate of the cosmos. Well, uh, I, I, I get what you mean, but it's, it's also where real life human beings live and are trying to make a life and trying to shop and have babies and raise families and, and get jobs and, and pray and, and find a way to live with each other in an incredibly difficult situation. Uh, so the rest of us, having, uh, much as I love the discussion, the, all of us, in a way, speaking out of our traditions, claiming our relationship to this place, also owe it to the people who actually live there to leave it to them. Do we have questions? Okay. What is the message of Jerusalem the city and Jerusalem, Jerusalem the book for someone who's an atheist and who is not searching for God's faith? Well, atheists are, are one real chance of being saved from religion. So <laughs> it's important for me to know that in the ancient Roman world, Jews and Christians were both regarded as atheists because they failed to bow to the conventional gods. Uh, atheism has been a profound form of attention to the other, what we might call to the transcendent. Um, so we shouldn't be 
too ready to see atheism as the polar opposite of, of faith. Um, my, my own sense is that we live in a time when traditional structures of religious imagination have been turned upside down. I don't think it's coincidental that Dietrich Bonhoeffer, as a, speaking as a Christian, writing as a Christian, uh, was one of the first to call into question our traditional Christian categories and whether they're adequate anymore and that he did it from a Nazi prison awaiting his execution is also to the point. Uh, can we affirm our connection to Jesus without religion is how I remember his question. Religionless Christianity uh, and there was a time in the 1960s and 70s when religious institutions themselves took up in a very direct way the question of the limits of religious categories, the so-called death of God movement, which was trivialized in the media. No offense, Lisa. <laughs> I never trivialize uh, anything. <laughs> no, t turning you into the media. Um, <laughs> trivialized in the media. So, you know, my, my own feeling, atheism depends on what you mean. <laughs> depends on what you mean by atheism and what's the value being affirmed. There can be nihilism, but there can be a profound humanism in atheism as well. Um, here's another question. Um, do you see a contradiction in an ideal of the West existing in the East? Maybe Imam Faisal could start with this one. The idealism of the... It, it's a Western idea. Jerusalem is a Western ideal, and yet, and yet it exists in the East. It's an Eastern place. Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't use the word West and East unless you define that a little further. If you mean by West, you know, uh, a, a Christian and Jewish understanding of Jerusalem versus a Muslim understanding, if that's what is meant by West and East, then I can understand that question. Um, but certainly the importance of Jerusalem uh, is, is there mm -hmm. primarily for the, for the Abrahamic faith religions. Uh, I doubt that Jerusalem is of much significance to the Buddhist or Hindu religions of the, of the Orient. Um, but what I'd, li I'd like to comment on the issue of, of atheism. I, I uh, remember being part of a, of a uh, delegation to Iran and we met a very lovely Ayatollah who was under house arrest in Qum. And he said, to us, and I've never forgotten this. He said, if someone does what he or she truly believes, acts accordance to their conscience, they are a Muslim, meaning submitted to God, even though they apostatize. Um, I'm not sure how much atheism is, is a rejection of the uh, aspects of religious practice which we are, all have problems with. I mean, I have had problems when I went to, to, to Jerusalem or to, to, to Mecca, the same as you had when you first went to Jerusalem, we describe in your book. By the way, it's a lovely book. I haven't read every page, but I read many, many chapters of it. And I strongly recommend uh, the book, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. But one of the scenes you talk about when you first went to Jerusalem is that we all seek God. And, and I remember, you know, looking to experience God in the Kaaba. And I think you may have been somewhat along that journey as well. And there was this priest who says, he's not going to find God in those places, he's going to find it here under this, this trap door or something like that in one of your chapters. Um, the, the notion of where do we find God, I think that is the journey that everybody is looking for. I mean, those of us of my generation remember the Beatles song, George Harrison, I really want to see you, Lord. I think that describes the, 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 the eternal um, uh, pull, the eternal in instinct that every human being wants to see wants to see the Creator, wants to know the Creator, and it's that journey. And to the extent that Jerusalem or the Kaaba or any pilgrimage site is that it tends to uh, open up the possibility that we may see God there. But one of the things that we have learned, that I have learned, uh, is uh, best expressed by Rumi, where it says, I went to the Kaaba, to the Mecca looking for God, I couldn't find him there. I went to Jerusalem, I couldn't find him there. I went to all the spiritual spots, I couldn't find him, couldn't find him there. I went to all the spiritual spots, I couldn't find him there. Finally, I looked into my own heart, and there I found God. And I think the, the, the atheist is an agnostic who is searching for the ground of all being, what our Hindu friends call absolute being, absolute consciousness, absolute love, as our Christian fellow uh, people speak about. And I think that's the, 
That's my response to the atheistic impulse. That's a, the atheist, atheism question is a wonderful one and a, a, a different angle on that. I found one of the most compelling parts of the book um, an account of how in the human psyche and in our understanding of social life together there is this relentless drive to scapegoat and to require a sacrifice and that is most vividly apparent in religious stories but and this goes back to the question about nationalism it can just as easily be a story about a nation mm -hmm. and not about a god and so I think in the context of atheism um, there's no uh, assurance that even atheists will not fall prey to the very dynamics that you describe as being so destructive. There's no protection from that. Even in the absence of God, it can still be reproduced. Right. So. Well, well said. Um, I have two questions here that are sort of, they're interfaith questions, and I'm going to ask them together. Um, and, they, and they seem to be implicit, at least in this question, is a um, rejection of the phrase Judeo-Christian. We talk about, you know, is America a Christian nation? Is it a Judeo-Christian nation? What is our tradition? Um, many people have called for the adoption of the expression, the Judeo-Christian Islamic tradition. Is it possible to say that? Are we all from the same tradition? So that's the first question. And then the second question, which is connected, is um, can one develop a multi-faith worship experience focusing on Jerusalem as the city of peace? In other words, can we think of a ritual that we all do together that has Jerusalem at its center and have it be meaningful? These seem to me to be versions of the same question, so I thought I would just throw it out there. Uh, I'll take a stab at the, the first part of the question, which is, is it possible to say a, what is it, Judeo-Christian Islamic tradition? Yeah. Um, no, it's a mouthful. Um, <laughs> it's just way too clunky. We, we, need, we need to brand it better. Um, uh, I, I mean, I, I cannot help but observe that this country has um, gone on an arc of uh, inter-religious dialoguing. We used to just talk about... Uh, the Protestant ethic in this country and that the United States was a Christian country. And then we learned after World War II to talk about it as Judeo-Christian, in part because my teacher Louis Finkelstein, may he rest in peace, was very insistent that no, we were Jews and Protestants together. Um, and one of the great things he did just across the street at the Jewish Theological Seminary was to insist that Catholics and Protestants learned to speak with one another. Um, so we became Judeo-Christian. And now we're on the cusp of this mouthful of, you know, Judeo-Christian Islamic, uh, Abrahamic, if you will, um, which uh, I suppose gives men the advantage here, but otherwise we're going to have Hagar Sarek or something like that. Um, but there's what to be said, and, and I alluded to it earlier, that um, if we're genuinely monotheist, if we Jews, Christians, and Muslims share a notion that there is one God, then what divides us is only the ways in which we approach that God. Um, we share Allah as our God. We have our own tribal worship, if you will. So that comes to the second part of the question. Can we find some uniform way to worship? I'm not sure of the value. I mean, yes, it's nice on Thanksgiving. Um, but I think that each of us does need our birth tradition as a means of recognizing God and as a means of connecting with our own ancestry. That said, as we worship, we should learn to shape our prayers in a way that they're not often shaped to not exclude the other. I'd like to offer another thought about American religion, and I think this question about Judeo-Christian Islam, that, that's, that addresses the issue at the surface level, and it's by far the less important level. The religious character of America took on new form in the 20th century, shaped by the apocalyptic character of nuclear weapons. 
After 1945, when we erected the structure of nuclear deterrence as our method of holding back the threat from the Soviet Union, which was a demonic, atheist, Stalinist movement, let's not be unclear about that, to be resisted, for sure. Nevertheless, we tragically fell into a way of thinking about our relationship to being itself that was lifted right out of the book of the apocalypse, interpreted in its most fundamentalist way, dividing the world in a very Manichaean fashion between radical good and radical evil. It's only that division that would enable us to have as a slogan, and people remember this as a crackpot slogan, but it wasn't crackpot, better dead than red. Because the American military strategy presumed the destruction of civilization as preferable to any kind of mitigated, compromised, uh, negotiated halfway solution with our Soviet en enemy. I grew up in a world that took for granted the coming nuclear war. And in those days, it wasn't, God forbid, the, the loss of downtown Manhattan. It was, the destru it was nuclear winter. It was giving the earth over to the insects who would do fine, thank you. That was what we defined ourselves by. And that's profoundly religious. It's apocalyptic. It's saving the earth by destroying it. And that is our religion to this day. We have yet to dismantle this system or this way of thinking, which is the only reason that 800 billion to a trillion dollars can go uncriticized, unquestioned, as our defense budget every year, even in this era of savage budget cuts. It's the only reason that we still have thousands and thousands of nuclear weapons. And, and when we get a president who's determined to shrink the arsenal, he finds it politically impossible to do it. That is our religion, not Judeo-Christian Muslim. Our religion is nuclear weapons. I was going to just expand that a little bit and say also, given what you just described, the monotheism of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are all equally prone to the excesses of that kind of uh, fallout, literally, from a monotheistic view that divides the world that way. In terms of how we describe the United States today religiously, uh, it is such, I mean, it is so complex and diverse that I don't even know what it means to describe Christianity anymore and that there are, are times at which I feel uh, uh, closer to Imam Faisal than I would to some evangelical in my home state of Oklahoma. Did so I? so how, that, how, that, um, how, that, how that plays itself out. In terms of the ritual, um, I more and more think that it's not as much in the uh, carefully constructed conscious rituals that our future lies, but it's in the daily practices of our lives as we cohabitate and as we bump up against each other and learn at that, at that base level what it means that we share in each other's uh, world. I'd like to c comment on this too. I mean, James talks in his book about bad religion and good religion in your book. There's bad Islam and good Islam. There's bad Christianity and good Christianity. There's bad religious people and good religious people. From God's point of view, from my reading of the Quran and the, our scriptures, um, there's only heaven and hell. There's only those who receive God's approval and God's disapproval. Those who act well and those who... There are good Americans and there are bad Americans. Uh, there is an American ethic which represents the highest of American values, and there is those, the, the fears that represents the worst of, of Americans' fears. And FDR taught us we have nothing to fear but fear itself. I think fear is the thing that we need to eliminate from our vocabulary of action and replace it with love, which is what Jesus came to teach us about and represent. And I think the fact that he taught us about love and taught us to love our neighbors, taught us to love even your enemies, it, rather than fear them, uh, is the transformative action that represents the highest possible instinct of the, of the most developed and perfected human being. Um, and I think this is the ethic which represents the highest values of our faith traditions. And I believe there's something which I write about in my book 
uh, which, which can be described as a common ethic to Jews, Christians, and Muslims. Or we may recall, to make it a bit more comp compressed, the Abrahamic ethic. Because the, these faith traditions introduced the idea not only of the oneness of God, but the oneness of humanity. Before that time, whether it was in Egypt, in Rome, or in the Far Orient, people believed in different class of society. People believed that the emperor in Japan, or the pharaoh in Egypt, or Caesar were semi-divine. They were children of God. And people were classified into classes of human beings from the, from the, from the Brahmins to the untouchables. And each society had its own notion of that. I think what the Abrahamic ethic, what our faith religions taught, is that God is one, we're all descendants of Adam and Eve, we should all love each other as brothers and sisters. Uh, and, and America has established that. And the American form of democracy, our form of democracy has actually changed the oriental societies. I mean, I grew up as a young kid in Malaysia, remembering Brahmins who wouldn't touch food touched by an untouchable. But with the increase of democracy in India, in China, in Japan, we see, we see Buddhism and Hinduism today maintaining its, 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 um, its, uh, its uh, existential worldview. But the notion of human beings as being separated into classes is being broken up by democracy today. And that to me is, I, I think, one of the contributions, if you will, you make, uh, from, of, of, the, of the common ethic that, of, that, that we Abrahamic faith religions have. I agree with Bert that, that it is God's intention, I mean, our scriptures speak, that God sent to every community a, a prophet and messenger to teach people how to love God and worship God in their own language. So from my point of view, it's God's intent to be worshipped in different languages. So, so it, it's, uh, if you want to choose you know, to speak English, to speak French, to speak German, if you want to make love in French or make love in English, I mean, this is your option. And, and we, should, we should celebrate that variety and perhaps even learn. I mean, I have learned a lot about my own religion by leading other religions. I encourage my, my congregants to learn more about Christianity, to learn more about Judaism, to learn about Hinduism, because you, you understand your own religion better usually that way. Just like understanding another language you know, makes you understand your own language better. Um, so these are just some thoughts I just want to throw out there for the time being. I think that's a good place to stop. Jim, do you want to say anything in, in conclusion? I, I would love to just say in conclusion a deep heartfelt word of thanks to you all for coming here today to giving us the honor of your attention. I want to thank you, Lisa, for your great moderating and your comments, and Bert, Serena, Imam, and Chloe Breyer, wherever you are, thank you so much for your welcome. A great job, uh, and Dean James Parks Morton. Dean Evans. Dean Evans, God bless you. Thank you. That was James Carroll and others discussing the past and present of Jerusalem. For more information, visit jamescarroll.net.